What is a declassified document that is so unbelievable it sounds fake? Project A119 was a top secret study by the US government to predict the effects of detonating a nuclear warhead on the moon big enough to be visible from Earth. They wanted to do this because they thought the Soviets would be doing something similar for the anniversary of the October Revolution. It didn't end up going ahead because the study unsurprisingly concluded that this was a terrible idea. Two funny things about this. The Soviets were indeed doing a similar study and came to the same conclusion. And the reason it was declassified is because one of the scientists working on this project was Carl Sagan and he accidentally leaked the documents of the project after using it as evidence of his previous lork when applying for a job years after it ended. I just love that the two most powerful governments on the planet were like, yeah, we might nuke the moon. Why? Well, because the other side might nuke the moon, okay? As for the reasoning, we agree it's stupid, but you know, if they nuke the moon, we just have to do it too. Just goes to show that even governments are prone to just like stupid feats of competition. Hey man, that's how it be sometimes in reality. What's going on guys? It's your boy Scrub here back again with another video. Hope you guys are having a great day. I know I am. I was browsing Reddit, stumbled upon this Ask Reddit thread about insane declassified documents. Just figured it would make a fun video because I found it interesting. So uh, yeah, that's what we're going to be talking about today. If you think you're going to enjoy it, be sure to press the like button. It helps the video do better. And without further ado, let's get into some CIA black ops operations here. The wreckage of the Titanic was found because the Navy was looking for the wreckage of two nuclear subs in the area. They staged the expedition as a private venture to find the Titanic to cover for the fact they were looking for the submarines. They actually ended up finding all three wreckages, although they only reported the Titanic at the time. Yo, I'm just saying there's certain things that I feel like we shouldn't really be losing tracks of and nuclear submarines are one of them. The fact that we lost two and we're like, ooh, maybe we should get those. Uh, by the way, it's by the Titanic, you know. This part of the ocean is just should just be a no-go zone. Like, if the Titanic and two nuclear submarines go down there. From now on, we should just avoid it. It's like the cold Bermuda Triangle up there, dude. Operation Mincemeat. A dead British officer washed ashore in Spain during World War II with a briefcase of top secret documents handcuffed to his wrist. Spain is neutral, but as a fascist nation, supported Germ Germany tactically and allows them to photograph the documents before returning it to the British so they can continue to remain neutral. The documents detail an allied plan to launch a naval invasion of Greece and attack into Germany from the Somme underbelly that is the Balkans and Hungary. The Germans eat the bait and the Axis move forces to defend against this front in Greece. However, this is where the Allies reveal their trap card and invade a much more poorly defended Sicily. The British officer was just a random Welsh homeless person who had recently passed away and was dressed up as an officer, given a detailed set of papers and a backstory, including love letters and pictures of a girlfriend, some fake papers in a briefcase, and dropped off the coast of Spain by submarine. I'm just imagining how the conversation went down at some point. They're like, well, how do we know this information is real? And they're like, come on, dude. You think they wrote fake love letters and made a whole fake backstory for some fake information? You're an idiot, Clyde. Meanwhile, in England, they're like, dude, those idiots are actually moving their troops. I can't they believe they believe that stupid crap we fed them. Just some random dude floating off the coast, no boat nearby, nothing, just happens to have detailed plans of an invasion. It's obvious in retrospect that it was probably a setup, but at the time, I don't think people were really doing doing this a whole lot. There's a declassified CIA document about them interviewing people who claim to be able to astral project themselves onto Mars into underground alien cities or something, and it was super in-depth, but I can't remember what it's called. I believe it was the Stargate program, also called the Remote Viewing Project, and it's been a long time since I read anything on it, so it might be off. I'm just saying, dude, if the CIA was paying people to, like, astral project and then tell them about Mars, you know? I'm not saying astral projection isn't real, I'm just saying I would have a really hard time believing somebody just didn't have like a really vivid dream. Yeah, man, I'm telling you, I just meditated for six hours straight and I was on an alien planet talking to people on Mars and they were telling me that they uh, actually used to harness the power of slinkies going down the stairs to make their spaceships work. The CIA is like, all right, well, we have to write this down and declassify it one day, but it doesn't mean it meant anything, you know? There's a declassified CIA document called Soviet Jokes for the DDCI, presumably the deputy director, that just has a list of various political jokes about the USSR, similar to the ones Reagan would occasionally tell. The purpose of the list is unclear, but it's pretty weird. 
Does that mean that somewhere is like the head joke writer for the CIA, dude? That's the funniest position. He like knows all the nation's secrets. He's the only person allowed to write jokes about it. Seriously though, I just love the idea of they're like, <clears throat> when we're briefing him about the nuclear program, we're going to need to uh, up it with a little humor. Please get the CIA joke writer to send me over a list of jokes immediately. What is the difference between a paper airplane and a Russian nuke? Nothing. They go the same distance. But dumb. thank you, you incredible comedian. That was quite a funny joke. I just can't imagine anyone in a serious government position being able to tell a joke very well. The CIA attempted to train cat spies. They trained cats to be spies by implanting recording equipment in their bodies and letting them loose near Soviet buildings. The cats could accurately travel short distances to targets, but the training didn't stick well enough for the cats to meet the eavesdropping needs. The program got shut down after a few million dollars worth of investment. As some people have pointed out, the only cat trained in this project got hit by a car after wandering away from its target in a park, adding to just how bad this project was. I mean, obviously, first rest in peace, cat, you know, I, I don't think you deserve to die in the name of the government. Other than that, though, I'm just kind of flabbergasted they ever expected this to work, dude. Only the U.S. government would be like, hey, we've got 20 million dollars, should we try to train a cat to be a spy? Like, uh, yeah, probably not the best use of 20 million dollars. No wonder our country's so in debt, dude, you know, the CIA is just out here like, we need 40 billion, why? We're gonna teach dolphins how to use a VHS machine. The Sigma War Game Series. It was a classified set of war games of possible U.S. involvement in Vietnam run several times over the early 1960s, and the U.S. lost almost every time. The best case scenario was where the war dragged on for several years until public opinion in the United States forced them to leave. So, basically, the government was entirely aware they would likely lose a war in Vietnam, but went in anyways, and they managed to pull off a best case scenario for themselves, and it only cost the Vietnamese a couple million dead. Alright, obviously Vietnam War was sucked, you know. That being said, what did you think? The government was going to listen exclusively to only the simulation that was ran? I mean, hindsight's 2020, right? But I'm sure they're running simulations 24-7, 365 days a year. I wouldn't have done it. I'm not in charge of the government. I'm glad I'm not. I don't want any decisions I make to have to be important ones, you know? But I do think they probably make their decisions based off a little more than just, like, one type of simulation. Hopefully, hopefully. Project Thor would use connect bombardment dropping telephone pole sized tungsten rods from orbit with a similar impact force to a nuclear bomb. It also served as the inspiration for a severely overrated Call of Duty game, too. Or overhated? I don't know, man. I think uh, most of the Call of Duty games from that era were actually kind of dookie poop. You know, they lost themselves for a bit. That being said, I think that's the real benefit of all these declassified government documents, okay? The movies and video games that we get with it, alright? Sure, I'm sure we got some secret space weapon. If those ever go off, I'm screwed anyways. Until then, keep feeding me the sci-fi garbage video game dribble that I crave. Wasn't there one involving stealing a wrecked Soviet submarine in the Pacific? I feel like one of my older relatives sent me something like, as, uh, things from my job I wasn't allowed to mention until now type of thing. Yeah, Howard Hughes built a ship under the cover story of a deep sea mine that the CIA used to recover a sunken Soviet sub. They were able to grab it and claw it and lift it, but it broke apart before it reached the surface, and they were able to recover a large piece of the sub and dig through it. You can find a video online, just declassified, of them performing a naval burial for several Soviet soldiers whose bodies were recovered. It does make you wonder how many, like, random stuff that people appear to be doing for no reason might just be secretly to go get something for the government, you know? Like, what's that director that went to the bottom of the Marianas Trench for no reason, James Cameron? Like, come to find out he secretly went down there to retrieve the AllSpark for the CIA so that way the Transformers didn't attack us? I'm just saying, can't rule anything out, dude. If Howard Hughes was doing secret missions for the government back then, who knows what they're up to now? Material fog bank. It was used in nuclear warheads to make them more effective, but it was kept so secret that they forgot how to make it. Man, I love this. Between this and the cat, it's like how many millions are just being wasted on stuff we don't remember or don't have anymore. Oh yeah, we came up with this super sick thing. It makes nukes like four times as powerful. How do you do it? Oh, uh, we actually forgot. It almost sounds like the excuse you would use if you didn't do your homework, you know? Like they were supposed to be developing this thing for the government. They just kind of forgot. What if we just pretend that it got so classified we forgot how to do it? And they're like, you're a genius. The Ghost Army was a U.S. tank for 
grenade in World War II. Except instead of actual tanks and soldiers, it was made up of inflatable tanks and art school students. They cruised around pretending to be an actual brigade to deceive Axis forces, and it worked, and the activities remained classified for 50 years. There's a cool documentary about it if you want to learn more and see what it looked like. I feel like stuff like this insanely creative stuff just doesn't really work that well anymore with satellite imagery that can zoom in so much, you know? Like, I'm thinking about right now, we know exactly where the supply lines are for Russia, how close they are to Ukraine, all that stuff. Just because, like, random companies are flying their satellites over and taking pictures, you know? Gone are the days of being able to use inflatable tanks to confuse your enemy. I I'm just thinking, if you still are confusing people with inflatable tanks, they really need to up their game out here, you know? If Google Earth is able to tell if your tanks are fake but your military can't, that might be a problem. The Sniffer Planes The Great Oil Sniffer hoax in 1979 was a scandal involving French oil company Elf Antiquitaine. The company spent millions of dollars to develop a new gravity wave-based oil detection system, which was later revealed to be a scam. ELF lost over $150 million to the hoax, and in France, the scandal is known as Avions Renaflares, which is sniffer aircraft, apparently. There you go, my French is horrible. See, when giant companies or governments get scammed, it just makes me ask so many questions, right? Like, you're an oil company, you uh, are supposed to be really good at the whole oil drilling thing. Up comes this guy who you've never heard of before who's like, hey, I can find oil with gravitational pulses. Never heard of it before, he has no proof it works, but trust me, if you give me $150 million, I can make the technology work. How does everyone in that oil company go, nah, this is a good idea, sign off on it, give him the money for like years and years? You know, I'm assuming after year one when you've given him 50 million and he still can't make it work that you would be like, ah, we might be getting scammed here. How much money do you need to give the dude who's trying to use Harry Potter magic to find oil before you realize he probably doesn't have the Harry Potter magic to find oil? The Zimmerman Telegram. Germany sent a telegram to the Mexican president to take back Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico. America was enraged by it enough to enter the war and the Mexican president realized it wasn't feasible to try to take those states back. All right, obviously I'm no historian out here, but I feel like between Japan attacking Pearl Harbor and Germany sending a telegram to Mexico telling them to attack us, for a bunch of people that apparently didn't want the United States to get involved in the war, they sure did seem like they really wanted the United States to get involved in the war. Not recent, but the CIA redacted report has been available since 2013, and I thought about the one about Area 51 since I found it pretty interesting. Area 51, AK Homie Airport or Groom Lake, was actually a testing facility for historically technologically advanced military planes such as the A-12. The U.S. government's secrecy and cover-ups over the nature of these aircrafts is what gave birth to the narrative surrounding UFOs in Area 51. On the 26th of November, 1954, the day after Thanksgiving, Alan Dules called his special assistant, Richard Bissell, into the office to tell him that President Eisenhower just approved a very secret program and that Dules wanted Bissell to take charge of it. Saying it was too secret for him to explain, he gave him a packet of documents and told him he could keep it for several days to acquaint himself with the project. He had long known of the proposal to build a high-altitude reconnaissance aircraft, but only in general terms. Now he learned in detail about the project that proposed sending aircraft over the Soviet Union. Late on the morning of the 2nd, December 1954, Duels told Bissell to go to the Pentagon on the following day to represent the agency at an organizational meeting of the project. This led to the delivery of the first U-2. On the 25th of July, less than eight months after the go-ahead from Trevor Gardner, Kelly Johnson was ready to deliver the first aircraft known as Article 351 to the Paradise Ranch site. With its long, slender wings and tail assembly removed, it was wrapped up in tarpaulins, loaded aboard a C-124, and flown to Groom Lake, where Lockheed Mechanic spent the next six days readying it for its maiden flight. Testing the U-2 led to UFOs and Operation Blue Book. High-altitude testing of the U-2 led to an unexpected side effect of a tremendous increase in reports of UFOs. In the mid-1950s, most commercial airliners flew at altitudes between 10 and 20,000 feet, and military aircraft like the B-47 and 57 operated between 40,000 feet. Consequently, once the U-2 started flying at altitudes above 60,000 feet, air 
traffic controllers began receiving increasing numbers of UFO reports. Such reports were most prevalent in the early evening hours from pilots of airliners flying west or east to west. When the sun dropped below the horizon of an airliner flying at 20,000 feet, the plane was in darkness. But if a U-2 was airborne in the vicinity of an airliner at the same time, its horizon from an altitude of 60,000 feet was considerably more distant, and being so high in the sky, its silver wings would catch the rays of the sun and appear to the other airliner pilot 40,000 feet below. It would appear to be a fiery object. Even during the daytime, the silver bodies of the high-flying U-2 could catch the sun and cause reflections or glints that could somehow be seen at lower altitudes and even on the ground. At this time, no one believed manned flight was possible at 60,000 feet, so no one expected to see an object high in the sky. Not only did the airline pilots report their sightings to air traffic controllers, but they and ground-based observers also wrote letters to the Air Force at Wright Air Department Command in Dayton charged with investigating such phenomena. The whole report is 54 pages long and goes on to talk about the cover story, that if the plane were to be discovered on foreign soil, it was supposed to be a weather object, etc. However, the report ends with the following sentence. Even in such a case, however, the proposed policy for the U.S. to stick to the weather research story, a course of action that would prove disastrous in 1960. The disastrous incident was an embarrassing situation for the U.S. that happened during the Cold War. In 1960, the Soviet Union shot down one of the planes when it was spying in their territory. Initially, they acknowledged the incident as the loss of a civilian weather research aircraft operated by NASA, but were forced to admit the mission's true purpose when a few days later, the Soviet government produced a captured pilot and parts of the U-2 surveillance equipment, including photographs of Soviet military bases taken during the mission. The incident occurred during the presidency of Dwight D. Eisenhower and the premiership of Nikita Khrushchev around two weeks before the scheduled opening of an East-West summit in Paris. Khrushchev and Eisenhower had met face-to-face -face at Camp David in Maryland in 19 1959, in the seeming thaw in U.S.-Soviet relations that had led people around the world to hope for a peaceful resolution to the Cold War. The U-2 incident caused great embarrassment to the U.S. and shattered the amiable spirit of Camp David that prevailed for eight months, prompting the cancellation of the planned Paris summit. All right, obviously at Area 51, they're testing a bunch of secret stuff. I think that makes sense. It makes sense that when you start testing, you know, project aircraft UFO reports go up. That makes sense. The one thing I'm not understanding about all that is if you're testing the U-2 and like airline pilots are noticing it and people on the ground are noticing it, why did they magically decide that it's good enough to fly over your biggest enemy's territory and spy on them, dude? If like normal day-to-day -day Americans not looking for a spy or seeing this thing, then obviously like the air defense that scanning for this stuff is probably going to catch on that there's a plane up there, you know? I know that's the whole point of making it. I'm sure we did it a bunch and didn't get caught. But overall, the whole spy plane thing kind of uh, loses its luster when you realize Dan, the airline pilot, is reporting it in too. Anyways, guys, I do think that's going to do it for the video, though. I just thought this would be like a fun topic. It's a little bit different than the stuff that I normally go over in the Reddit videos. So if you did enjoy it, I'd appreciate you taking a second to press the like button. Let me know in the comment section down below below what you thought, and of course, subscribe if you're new and turn on notifications. If you really want to help me out, I'll put a link to the intro song down below, along with a link to my podcast, The Scuffed Cast, or you could use code SCRUBBY at the G Fuel checkout, another great way to get a discount on G Fuel. Other than that, I do post some of my content on Spotify, so in the top of the description, there's going to be a link to my Spotify show. Feel free to go check it out. And of course, you can also get yourself a link to the merch from the description. It's pretty fantastic if you ask me, so uh, be sure to go get it if you haven't already. And on that note, guys, that'll officially do it for the video. Don't get anyone pregnant. If you do, make sure they're hot. And hopefully I'll see you guys next time. I'm out. Peace.